Hello everyone and welcome to another Lancaster Safety Webinar Wednesday. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We hold these free webinars once a month and invite everyone to attend. Our clients have the added bonus of having instant access to all of our safety and health webinars, newsletters, checklists, toolbox talks, training guides, and so much more. We're a full service OSHA management company who truly believes in taking safety beyond the OSHA standards. My name is Emily and I'm here today with Sherry, one of our safety and health consultants and trainers based out of Texas. Sherry is a master practitioner in neurolinguistics. So simply put, she teaches about how the brain processes language. Sherry teaches four hour and eight hour leadership workshops. She was also the first female firefighter paramedic by the Dallas Fire Rescue Department in 1977. She specializes in emergency healthcare and OSHA training emergency equipment and services such as inspections, consulting, and other life-saving equipment such as AEDs. In addition to being an on-site safety and health trainer, she also conducts seminars, webinars, and motivational speaking engagements. So Sherry, thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, Emily, I'm always excited to be with Lancaster. They are some of my favorite people in Europe to big business, and I love it because you help keep people safe. So let's move on to the objectives. And today we're going to understand that there are some problems in communications, and we're gonna talk about team dynamics and how they play in the world of safety. We're gonna cover some science. The science is about how to give feedback and how to do a structured debriefing. That is an amazing tool, both of them are, that help you manage your employees much more effectively. And then we'll move on to some difficult conversations and how to easily have them. We'll talk about emotional intelligence and then of course the role of the safety leader. Now, part of this is we're gonna identify some at-risk behaviors. And I love the cheat method. And I have a really good cheat sheet for documenting employees' behavior. It is so easy, you will love it. And then understand how discipline improves efficiency. And then of course, we're gonna talk about uh, investigations and what some of the leadership requirements are. But let's move on to the next slide, Emily. And let's talk about what leadership is. Now, a lot of people tend to think it's power or desire or luck, maybe influence some drive and passion. But I wanna give you just a second to think about it and choose which one you think leadership is. And the answer is, you are right if you picked influence. So let's go to the next slide. And the next slide starts with babies cry for it, grown men die for it, and leaders, they have plenty of it. So which one of these do you think the answer might be? Food, treasure, recognition, oxygen? And the answer is, if you picked recognition, you are correct. So, knowing those things, let's move forward to some of the problems in communications. So what the science shows is that you and I have two billion bits of information coming to us at all times. Now, the human mind cannot absorb everything. So the, the guidelines show that we really only absorb about 126 bits at a time. So what happens to the other information that's coming at us? Well, we delete, we distort, and we generalize it is what they say. So when we do this, we end up creating assumptions and then we also get into what we call mind reading. So what I ask leaders to do, especially leaders who are in the safety arena and they're handling investigations, is to slow things down. Investigate and consider all the other possibilities. And we're gonna, we're gonna do that in a team dynamic approach and we'll move to that in just a minute, but think about it. If you had an incident and you were to sector that incident and you gave a quarter of it to one person, a quarter of it to another, a quarter of it to another, and a quarter of it to another, the chances are you're gonna get a much more robust 
pictures. So let's talk about what Team Dynamics really is and how we're going to use Team Dynamics in the workplace. So when you're looking at Team Dynamics, there's eight specific things that we're looking at. The first one is clear roles and responsibility, and that's kind of a given. Clear communication. And then probably the most important one is mutual respect and inclusion. Now I'm going to tell you, I want you to think for a moment about that employee that just put you over the edge. And what do you think about them? And inside of your head, you've got to give that up. You've got to show them respect and you have to include them in, it, in everything to be a really fair leader. We also do what's called knowledge sharing. You know, it's just such an important part of it when somebody is sharing what's going on in another arena that impacts yours. And then, of course, constructive intervention. I think of the new employee who accidentally hits the wrong gauge and suddenly there's a gas release or something going on in a facility. And you, inside of your team dynamics, you see it happen, you take action, and you shut off the emergency uh, gauge that cuts it off and stops the leak. That's some pretty powerful constructive intervention. I had a physician once and he ordered me to give three milligrams of epinephrine to a pediatric patient. Now, just so you know, three milligrams would kill me and you. It would just kill us. So all I did was say, hey doc, you said three milligrams, but you meant 0.03, correct? And he looked at me and he goes, yes, that's what I said. I said, and I said, no problem, I got it, 3.3 uh, milligrams. That was some powerful constructive intervention. At the end of the cardiac code, he came to me and he said, hey, Sherry, thank you for catching that. I said, hey, it could have been me. We're on a team. And that's what team people do. We don't make fun of somebody who makes a mistake. We welcome them and we protect one another. That's some powerful team dynamics. The next thing we use is closed loop communication. Remember the doctor said, give three milligrams? I repeated that back to him. Doc, you said three. That confirms the communication. And then I intervened with the 0.03. So you always want to close communications when you are operating in critical areas, especially those of safety. And if you teach these things to your employees, it's going to be easy for them to understand and, and know how to operate. The next one is uh, knowing one's limitations. And here's the thing, when you're part of a team and something is about to take place and you're not clear, you need to speak up and share what you're not clear about. You no, need to know your limitations and let the team know so that it doesn't impact everybody in a negative way. And I can so appreciate somebody sharing with me that because what it does is as a safety officer and as an inspector, it allows me to clarify and it lets me know where they, the training is needed. And then of course, we're always reevaluating in safety. We're always looking at what's going on and making sure that things are safe. And so uh, safety officers, they have to be good at delegation because if you're busy, 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 doing, 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 you're not going to be able to be present and evaluate what is actually going on inside of the workplace. So we're going to move a little bit further on to behavior-based safety. And behavior-based safety is really a lot of what neurolinguistics is, is how the brain processes information. And it can be simple little changes such as you're wrong and I'm right to, hey, look what's missing that could make a difference to you. It's just a little bit of change in the language and how we speak to people. And when we do it neutrally and we do it respectfully, people are like, wow, thanks for sharing. But if you use the old model of force and control, you're going to get resistance from employees. So if you're getting resistance, there's something there 
for you to be responsible for as a safety officer or as a leader. You've got to think. And, you know, I call it shining the light on the motives. What are your motives? How are you operating? And most of us, it's not that we're wrong. It's just that we were trained a certain way. And that's the way we know to do it. And just consider that there's some other possibilities for you. And we want to focus on what people do and why they do it. And then we're going to show you some tools here in a minute, feedback and structured debriefing to help them think through it and learn and grow. Now, human and organizational performance, HOP, uh, a lot of great information there. That's where they understand and, and use leading safety indicators to make changes that prevent uh, injuries from occurring and, and hopefully with the goal of uh, minimizing any kind of negative impact that those could have. So let's move on to the next slide. We want to talk about feedback. I want to invite you to consider that feedback is just data. Wouldn't it be nice to know a blind spot? Inside of feedback, you provide direct and measurable information. And remember, we keep everything neutral. A lot of leaders get very impassioned. And I can appreciate that passion. I'm a passionate person, too. But when you're talking and dealing with people, you have to give it in a neutral format. Otherwise, you're going to shut them down. And your goal is to open them up and get them to do what it is you need them to do. And staying neutral is going to help you when you give feedback. One of the real tricks of feedback is to give lots of it. And I observe people and I give them a lot of praise. Hey, I really appreciate your job today. Hey, good job. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for that extra time you spent. Now, I want you to think about that. If you're constantly providing positive feedback to an employee, what happens is you get them into a place of agreement with you. You say something, they nod their head in agreement. You say something else, they nod their head in agreement. And you want to gain agreement with people when you're leading them. Now, when it's time to give some negative feedback, you have already trained them to agree with you. And one of the methods I use is called a praise tag praise. I use it for minor infractions. But before I ever start, start any kind of critical uh, feedback to them, I'm going to find something to thank them for and to honor them for to make the message a little bit smoother and easier um, to swallow. So let's move on to structured debriefing, in Emily. And the structured debriefing is just, it is the cornerstone of learning. If you learn to use this inside of safety, it's going to rock your world. Now, some of you have some of those employees and you think, man, I just can't get the message through. Well, let's talk about what this structured debriefing does. A structured debriefing is really nothing more than a set of open-ended questions. Now, a closed-ended question is, what color is that? And the answer is black or red or whatever. That's a closed-ended question. But if you ask an open-ended question like, tell me how you see this piece of equipment working, what happens is people go into their heads and you will see even shifts in their eyes. And, and if they're making it up, they're going to look up and to the right. And if they're trying to find the information, they're going to look up and to the left and they're going to be digging for that information inside their head. And what it does is it triggers critical thinking skills. So the goal of the safety leader is not to give them the answer. Because when you give them the answer, they're like, you know, he came and told me what to do. But if you help them find the answer by asking questions and triggering their critical thinking skills, and they finally put it together, and their highly self-flattering view comes out and says, yeah, baby, I figured this out on my own. 
that's the cornerstone of learning and it becomes a sticky lesson to them one that will stay with them because they got the answer themselves without you giving it to them it's an amazing learning tool now I want you to think about your job hazard analysis and your hot work permits what are those those are nothing more than critical questions about a job you're fixing to start. Now what happens is a lot of people will pencil with these, but the whole goal behind them is to trigger critical thinking skills about each segment of what you're about to do and have you think through it and have you look for what the hazards could be. And so if you think about a hot work permit, it says, is there a fire extinguisher near? and you look around and you don't see a fire extinguisher, now you go and get one. You see, that's a critical element that was missing that would make a difference in about what you're about to do. And so you never want to skip through these things. You want to utilize these things and allow these things to help you and protect you. I think, Emily, it's time for a question. It is. So our first Insta Safety question a safety manager recognizes that an employee has removed a guard from a machine. Which team dynamics method would you use to address this situation? Would it be A, fix the guard immediately and write the employee up, B, use constructive intervention, or C, hold a company safety meeting and review proper machine guarding procedures? So I'll give you just a minute to put in your answer. Okay, hopefully you put in constructive intervention as your answer. So if I saw them, let's say that they're working on a machine and I walk up and I see that there's moving parts to that machine that are exposed and I look down on the floor and I see the guard. And so I would just simply ask the question, hey, tell me about this machine and I let them go into their head, their highly self-flattering view, and they're thinking, oh wow, she's interested in what I know, and then they start telling me about the machine. The science says that when they get to the piece of the guard that's missing, most of the time, they will even tell you that. Now, normally there's a guard here, but we're not using it right now. Oh, really? Ask another question. Can you tell me why the guard's not there? Because, see, you want to understand why people behave the way they do. And so they say, well, the boss told us that we, you know, we normally do 150 of these today, uh, but today we've got to do 200. And the only way to speed it up is to remove that guard. So... Do you see how that reveals answers to you? And you begin to understand why. Now, there's some culpability there. If they're doing this to try to please um, the higher ups, and we need to be clear that safety is so much more important than the money. Because I can tell you, <laughs> I had a company, they uh, changed a knife that they were using just to open boxes. And when they changed the knife, they suddenly had this big soaring of people getting injured. And I came in and I, I started looking and looking at the, the injury reports and looking at the 300 reports. And, and uh, I went back to purchasing and I said, hey, can you tell me why you went to this knife? And they said, oh, we saved $13,000 go into that knife. Well, that was good. $13,000 save and a $53,000 medical bill for several employees that got hurt. We always want safety people in on the process of purchasing too so that they can use constructive intervention also. Let's move on to difficult conversations. Um, difficult conversations, you know, real leaders aren't a to have them. 
I remember as being a young leader, I would get in my head and I would go, why are they thinking that? And, and I would just be having a conversation with myself. So, you know, the science actually says we have 80,000 conversations with ourselves every day. Now, I don't know who counted that. I always thought it was 60, but I made that number up. I stand corrected with the science, but we have these conversations. Here's the thing. You've got to recognize them, get out of your head, and get over there with that employee. You've got to be courteous. You've got to stay open-minded. And you have to understand their viewpoint. Because when you understand their viewpoint, you will understand why they're doing the behavior. And that's the crucial key, is to understand why. So that's when you can go in and do some constructive intervention in that area. So we want to maintain respect because conflict, it's got to be safe. And then we clearly state the facts and then we document. And, and I always tell leaders, never get hooked. And what I mean by hooked is hooked into being so right that you make somebody else wrong. Remember, we slow things down. We listen to find out what's missing that would make a difference to people. And if you present it that way, no, you're wrong, they're not going to listen. But if you say, wait a minute, there's something, there's a piece missing for you that would make a difference. Let me share it with you. That's a team dynamics approach. So we get in those difficult conversations and we have them and we maintain respect when we're having them. So moving on to doing the difficult. So when we're doing the difficult, we have to maintain respect. So you see the guy, he's taken the guard off the machine. You've asked him the question, hey, tell me why. And he tells you. And he goes, well, you know, we have to do 200 today. So I go, okay, well, I have a request. And I wait until I have direct eye contact and I have their attention. If they're looking off or looking away, or acting shy in any way or too busy with something else, I just wait very patiently. And I will repeat, I have a request. And once I get eye contact and they say, yes, what's your request? I say, stop work immediately. Put the guard back on. Now, here's the reason why. I don't want to meet your wife or your husband or your children at the hospital and tell them why you can't hold them in your arms tonight because you, you're injured and you're missing three fingers or you have a broken leg or, or whatever the case may be. So when you're doing the difficult, maintain respect, call for the question, that structured debriefing, make a request and then make it about them. And when you do it, you walk away and people are like, wow, I think she actually cares about and it's much different from this resistance that you get when you make them wrong with what they're doing. So let's talk about emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is really nothing more than self-awareness of your behavior, self-awareness of your thoughts, um, getting out of your head and realizing that you've got a conversation going on. And here's why we want to do emotional intelligence. It's because we're being judged. And it's not by just how smart we are. It's by our, and it's not just our training and expertise, but it's by how well that we handle ourselves and one another. And so there's a bunch of different levels of awareness. I teach a course called Situational Awareness. And, you know, being aware of what's going on, that's a whole different science. But part of that is self-awareness, which is emotional intelligence. So let's move on to the safety leadership role. So safety leaders provide a safe workplace. They know how to recognize hand standards uh, or hazards. They know to how to comply with the safety standards. And you got to know the policies. <laughs> so if you write this guy up, you've got to know what the policy is. Is it three strikes and you're out? Or is it three days off? Or, 
or what is it? You have to know where to go for the answers. And the policies and procedures are just as important as the safety rules. You've got to be able to evaluate the workplace conditions. Uh, and then you have to use controls to mitigate the hazards. Now, what are the controls? Well, we all know the OSHA controls. We've either got to engineer, uh, control it out, or we have to write an administrative rule and train people. And then the last control is putting them in PPE. And remember that if you ever put your people in PPE, they have to be trained before you do. So moving on to the safety leadership role continued, we have to train our employees in their primary language and then uh, work-related injuries and illnesses and fatalities. We have to know what the rules are with reporting. Now, a lot of times your job, your first job is to notify um, the higher-ups in the company about what is going on, but you also have to make them aware that OSHA has to be notified. Our next slide will show you what some of those times are, but just remember that there's a clock ticking when people get injured. And then, of course, keep accurate records. So I, a lot of employ, employers do not understand that medical records and employee records are two separate things. Medical records are protected by HIPAA. And uh, HIPAA has just as much teeth as OSHA does. And so everything that's in a medical file cannot be shared with supervision. It cannot be shared with people that are, are in the workplace. So their supervisors have no right to that information. Um, employee records, absolutely. So make sure that you're keeping accurate records and that you're keeping them separately. And then, of course, you've got to document violations and take action. I had a client who should have gotten a $250,000 fine. That's exactly what I was thinking was coming. But you know what? I told them, I said, you've got to write these two guys up. They violated the rules. And the guy goes, man, I hate to write up one of my employees who got injured. And I said, sorry, write them up. And they wrote them up. They stayed respectful. The employee took it like a, like a big boy. And the thing that happened was that OSHA boy and the thing that happened was that OSHA reduced their fine to less than twelve thousand dollars and I was thinking they were going to get this huge fine so it's really important that you document that you're taking action with your employees now remember as of January 15th all work related fatalities you only have eight hours to know notify OSHA all work-related inpatient hospitalization. What does that mean? It doesn't mean they went to the emergency room or a clinic. It means that they got admitted into the hospital. You got to notify OSHA within 24 hours. And then of course, amputations or loss of an eye, you've got a 24 hour uh, notification. So um, we've got some numbers here for you so that you can call OSHA Direct or you can go to their website. There's all kinds of ways to document that you've notified. You can even leave them a message and, and tell them, you know, especially if it's after hours or something. I will tell you that if you do call them, you're probably going to get a visit from them because they're pretty quick to respond to accident scenes. So let's talk for a moment just about safety meetings. You've got to include management and hourly employees. And I even like mid-management. And the reason is because communications, it helps with communications getting out. But um, the leaders of the company, they have the money. And if you're in a safety meeting and you decide that you suddenly need PPE, who's going to pay for it? You better have somebody high ranking in there to help you do that. But it's important that you have the employee in there too, the hourly people, because you know what? They know the job. They know what they're faced with. And sometimes there's something missing for the safety committee that that one particular person can speak up and can say what they need to say. You're going to discuss incidences, near misses, corrective actions, any lessons that you learned, and then of course, uh, any kind of equipment that you have or PPE and any operations that are going on. 
and then of course inspections and reports. So inside of being a safety leader, you've got to learn to identify at-risk behaviors. I've always loved this picture because he is so determined to get this sign up and he is so about to either break a leg or break his neck, I don't know. I have responded as a firefighter and a paramedic to so many of these incidences that it's just uh, mind blowing. And I look at the ladder over there and it looks like he probably climbed that ladder at first and it didn't work and that ladder is nowhere near set right. So as a safety officer, you have to have your eyes peeled for what's going on. Now, if I were to see this man doing this, I would say, hey, Jim, come down here. I got something I got to tell you. And I would get him down as quick as I could. I would call for the question. I would make a request. And then I, I would just follow the procedures that we have talked about because they have to understand that we care about them. And if you do it in making them wrong or you make it about the company, you know, we've gone for 100 days without any injuries and you're going to mess it up. That is not about them. And they really don't care at the point of being injured. They care when it's about them and what they're up to. So I think it's time, Emily, for another question. Alrighty, this one says, um, what does handling a difficult conversation require? So is it A, questioning the employee and writing them up, B, questioning the employee and making a request, or C, showing respect, questioning the employee, making a request, and making it about them? So we'll give you just a moment to put in your answer. All right, Emily, I know they got this right because we just went over that. But yeah, we want to show respect to people. We want to question them, and that's that structured debriefing we talked about. And then we simply make a request and we make it about them or their family or somebody like that. Okay, so let's move on to documenting. A lot of people, they love their job, but God, when it comes to the paperwork, they just want to scratch their eyeballs out, right? Because it's just so much work. Well, I have found an easy way. Now, here's the thing. I'm always out doing inspections or teaching classes, and it's highly difficult for me to catch up with the paperwork. I do it on weekends. I do it until 10 o'clock at night, but I found this easy easy way. And so what I do is once I finish speaking with an employee, I step aside with my smartphone and I send myself an email. And the subject of the email is that employee's name. And then I just push the button and talk into the phone stating the facts. Uh, today, uh, Jim had removed the guards. He told me why. He was asked to increase his numbers from 150 to 200. End of it. Send it. Now, when I get back to my office, I have an email from myself that has Jim's name. I just drop it over into a file called Jim. If Jim has two or three of those, then now it becomes a time that I might have to write up Jim and, and document. So uh, think about it. Those emails have time dates and stamps of the event. So once I file it under the employee's name, let's go on to continuing documenting. I got to consider the company policy. So what is the company policy for this? I simply state the infraction. I cut and paste all the documentation. It includes those dates and timestamps. And then I state the discipline. And the employees look at that and they go, wow, you even know when and where? Wow. You see, now you stay neutral and you stay respectful. But what happens is discipline actually improves efficiency. All right, and that's on the next slide. So it sets an example of appropriate behavior. It transmits the rules of the organization. It promotes efficiency. And if you're respectful and thoughtful, they'll be respectful and thoughtful back. Now, one thing I never do is discuss people's names. Somebody will say, well, what happened to Jim yesterday? I heard he got injured. 
And I'll say, you know what, out of respect for Jim, that's his story to tell. Why don't you ask him? And people all sit there and go, wow, she would maintain my confidence too. And so you always want to be respectful and you always want to be neutral when you're handling difficult situations. So let's move on to investigations and what we don't want to do. When you're doing an investigation, it is not about exonerating a person or even management. And it's not about satisfying your safety insurance requirements. And I want you to even think about it's not about a legal argument either. We're not trying to assign blame with an investigation. What we are trying to do with an investigation, and that's on the next slide, and that is that we're gathering information, we're searching and establishing the facts. Now this is when you're going to want your full team helping you, right? Because remember, you're you're only getting 126 bits of that information out of 2 billion. We're going to isolate any of the contributing factors, finding the root cause, determining corrective actions, and then, of course, we're going to implement corrective actions. So leadership teams require, and this next slide talks about that we have to have a deep level of commitment from one another. And it takes rigorous and intentional work to cultivate highly effective teams. And the payoffs are enormous. A lot of times when I have an event happen and it's not a comfortable one, I really have to think about who I'm being at that moment. Because leadership is not what you do. Leadership is who are you being for the people that you lead inside of what you do. And we want to leave our employees touched, moved, and inspired about safety. We want them to feel like that our leader has a level of care for us that is above average. And so inside of all those conversations we have with ourselves, we have to challenge our own motives and how we feel and how we think about people. You know, I like to be the person that I don't care if we disagree. I don't care if we don't have the same religion or whether we don't have the same political views. I'm still going to respect you. And that's what real leadership is. And the final slide that I have for you today is it takes courage. The leadership that I do is called Courageous Leadership, the Distinctions of Highly Powerful leaders. And it's a lot of what we talked about today. So courageous leaders, they can be a blazing fire or they can be a cool drink of water. It's a choice. Which choice will you make when you're out there on the floor trying to keep your people safe? So with that, Emily, I'm going to turn that back over to you. Thank you so much, Sherry. That was really great information. And thank you to everyone for taking the time to listen in today. If you have any further questions, please call Lancaster Safety at 888-403-6026, and we'll be happy to help you. Also, follow us on social media for more news updates and safety information, or you can even provide us with feedback on either Yelp, Google, or Facebook. We truly appreciate your time and hope you'll take advantage of our monthly safety and health webinars. As you know, everyone is always invited to attend and they're always free. So just visit our website or click the link on your screen for more information. Thank you so much and have a safe day.